Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Uh, today, I'm delighted to talk to Ibrahim Mohamed Zain and Ahmed El Wakil. You're most welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Paul. Pleasure uh, to be on your channel. Well, it's a huge privilege. I think it's the first time I've had two guests on at the same time, so that's a first. Um, now, an exciting and momentous book has just been published by Routledge titled The Covenants of the Prophet Muhammad from Shared Historical Memory to Peaceful Coexistence by Ibrahim Muhammad Zain and Ahmed El Wakil. Now, this is a particularly important book, I think, for many reasons. It's a work that delves into the historical sources with a detailed examination of Islamic historical works concerned with coexistence between Christians and Muslims. Through an analysis of the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, which pledge protection to diverse faith communities like Jews and Christians and others, this book makes an important contribution to research on early Islam by determining the covenant's historicity and textual accuracy. The authors of this book, Ibrahim and Ahmed, uh, focus on the Prophet Muhammad's relationship with other faith communities by conducting detailed textual and linguistic analysis of documents that have received little scholarly consideration before. This not only includes the decrees of the Prophet Muhammad, but the companions such as Umar and Ali, amongst others. The authors uh, provide new and revised translations of various covenants issued by the Prophet Muhammad, which were attested by Muslim authorities after him. The authors argue that the claim of forgery, and this is a common claim in the Western Orientalist uh, tradition, is no longer tenable following the application of rigorous textual and historical analysis. Now, the book cover, um, which is uh, the book is now published, says this book is a central reading for Muslims, Christians, Jews, Samaritans and Zoroastrians, as well as anyone interested in interfaith relations, Islamic political philosophy, Islamophobia, security studies and the relationship between Orthodox and Oriental Christianity with Islam, end quote. Now, I just want to introduce very briefly our two honoured uh, guests and presenters. Uh, Ibrahim Mohamed Zain is a professor of Islamic studies and comparative religion at the College of Islamic Studies, Hamad bin Khalifa University in Doha, Doha in Qatar, where both our guests are currently uh, broadcasting from. He was previously Dean of the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization at the International Islamic University, Malaysia. Ahmed El Wakil is a researcher on the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad at the College of Islamic Studies uh, at the Hamid bin Khalifa University in Doha as well. So, gentlemen, um, would you like to introduce us to this fascinating subject? And I'll just put up the slides for you. Okay, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, maybe Professor Ibrahim would like to, to start by giving um, a brief uh, introduction of how this uh, journey began. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all like uh, all books, perhaps, but this is a little bit unique uh, compared with other experiences that I had personally. This is a book which is being done by two persons, uh, Ahmed and I, and uh, there was a kind of a division of labor doing this book. But the most important of all uh, is that we talk to each other uh, on daily basis uh, when developing this book for the last four years or so. Uh, Ahmed, I mean, I'm quite uh, grateful to him, was the one who did all the journeys uh, to collect the manuscripts from uh, uh, St. Catherine Monastery in, in, in Sinai, and he went to Mount Athos, and he went to wow. uh, Turkey, and he went to uh, Yerevan, uh, and, and uh, he also perhaps toured the Balkans, and some other, of course, I mean, Egypt also was included, 
Mm. And he is the one who did all the connections with the patriarchate, the Armenian patriarchate in Jerusalem, mm. uh, some other places in Jerusalem as well, some other uh, Christian churches in Jerusalem and, and elsewhere. And not to forget, I guess, Lebanon was also included into this. And he is the one also who traveled to Lebanon. Hmm. I uh, actually looked into his diary where he put all these things in his diary. And uh, whenever he uh, uh, I mean, uh, comes from a trip, we will discuss together uh, his own thoughts and his own uh, reflections on the kind of documents he collected and the kind of spiritual places he visited. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't done any uh, intellectual or spiritual visit. I was seeing all these things through his eyes. Mm. Uh, so he, he, he has to be acknowledged, I guess, in this regard. Mm. But but you, if, uh, if, just to show that that's the book cover, isn't it? On the, uh, the left-hand side of what we're seeing now, The Covenants of the Prophet Muhammad, a uh, book published uh, in the Rutledge Studies in Islamic Philosophy series with your names on. Uh, sorry. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, okay. that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. And, and and one thing I should should be saying, I mean, before we start this, allow me to thank you very much for having us with you. Uh, and uh, it's a great honor for us uh, to be on your channel. The honor is all mine, sir. Believe me, it's all mine. Thank you. You're welcome. Dave. So, yes. Can... Yes, Ahmed, uh, I think you will do the presentation. Go ahead. Yes, so basically it, it builds on uh, the research of uh, doc Dr. John Andrew Morrow when he wrote his book, The Covenants of the Pro Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of the World. And uh, so I think that book brought to the, to the attention of, I think, the general public the idea of the covenants because most people are not aware of it. And obviously it's, it's something that wasn't studied before really. There was very little studies on, on the subject matter. So, you know, we we, dis we wanted to, to build on that kind of uh, research that he had done. Mm. And uh, we wrote quite a number of articles. So I think we both agree, uh, I think, Dr. Wright, that our best article is the Safin Arbitration Agreement, which was published um, this year, well, last year in 2022. And it's open access. And also for your viewers, uh, we did one on the calendar and another one on the idea of uh, shared historical memory, which was published in 2020. So these articles, which are displayed uh, on the screen, uh, your viewers can, can read online. Well, 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 I, well, I do then, sorry. Uh, the, these open access uh, articles means that anyone can access them free of charge. They're not behind a paywall. So I'll add the links to the description below so people don't have to type it all out. They can just click on the links. Thank yes, you. sure. And before that, uh, I, I wrote uh, one article, which is also open access, and my um, MA uh, thesis, uh, the supervisor of it was Dr. Roy Fatouhi, and obviously Professor Zain was the internal examiner, and that's available on, on my academia page. So again, your viewers can read it, uh, can download it and read it for free. Uh, Dr. Fatouhi, your supervisor, by the way, is, is, a, is a regular guest on Blogging Theology. Yes. <laughs> And uh, he, he was a great help, actually. So uh, it, it read a lot better after his inputs and his, his uh, oh, comments. He's an amazing scholar. Yeah, yeah, very intelligent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, also other scholars have written uh, articles about uh, the covenants. So one of mm -hmm. our friends, Halim Rain from uh, Griffith University in, in Australia, he's recently published uh, a paper in 2022 about the reception and John Andrew Morrow as well, he wrote a very good uh, article about the problems of transmission of the covenants. So that, again, is available online. And uh, one of our friends from Armenia, uh, Dr. Gayan Makartumian, she also uh, did a study about uh, uh, the manuscripts in the Matanadaran, which is the house of manuscripts in Armenia. And that as well is, a, is an important article which, which your viewers could, could um, access after, after this. Okay, and um, so what are the covenants? Um, in short, they are documents which the Prophet gave to non-Muslim communities. And the covenant is, is normally is known, is popularly known as the Ahdanameh, 
and the Ahd Name comes from uh, the Arabic word Ahd, and Name it's uh, Persian, and um, it's usually, I mean, when, when people translate it, they usually uh, translate it as Book of Peace. That's how it's tend to be translated. So uh, a written uh, a, a covenant. And uh, they were granted to non-Muslim communities, the covenants initially, to give them uh, protection for their lives, their wealth, their property, and uh, their religion. And once the Prophet did that, then the companions who acceded to the caliphates, Abu Bakr, Omar, Ali, Muawiyah, they also did the same. Mm. So, yeah. Doctor, maybe you have anything to add? or? No, it's, it's just one thing, I guess, in addition to the important introduction that you made, uh, that these documents, we do not have the originals. Uh, we have copies of copies of copies of these documents. Uh, so uh, the reader, I mean, the, the viewer now should, should keep that in mind. I mean, we do not claim that the documents that we uh, collected from these different uh, uh, churches or places of uh, of worship, uh, we don't have the original documents, but rather we have copies of the original documents. So the study was based on these copies uh, of original documents. I mean, it goes without saying, I mean, we are speaking about uh, uh, almost more than 100 and uh, uh, 1,400 years. Mm. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you can't claim that that, that uh, 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 we are having the original ones. No, we don't. We don't. Uh, but you, uh, but having, having read a bit of your book, I don't want to jump, don't want to anticipate your conclusion, but your confidence nonetheless is, is that the, the, the covenants, the written covenants that do exist are an accurate and faithful representation of the originals, and you, you have good reasons for thinking that. Well, that's yes. correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's okay. Correct. That's absolutely right. Yeah. You say that in the book. Yeah. Okay. And uh, just to give you an overview, um, so of what these covenants uh, say. So, one of the uh, one of the clauses that you have is, and often quoted in different covenants, is the Quranic uh, verse: "There's no compulsion in religion," and they mm. all clearly, unequivocally say that you can never force a non-Muslim to become a Muslim. And they protect the Muslim. They get, they grant full religious freedom to to the non-Muslims, and the Muslims cannot intervene in their religious affairs. Uh, taxation is according to their capability, and uh, very interestingly, monks and priests are exempt from taxation. They they don't pay any tax, and they're eternal. So basically, uh, the rights that they grant to the non-Muslims they're a bit like in in the U.S. when they say inalienable rights. So rights which cannot be taken away from the non-Muslims, so no sultan, I mean, it's clearly stated in these governance that no sultan, no ruler, no one can take these rights away from them. And they apply until uh, the end of the world. So you often find that in these in these different covenants that until the day of judgment, their terms and conditions are applicable. And the values are all are necessary values for peaceful coexistence. Mm. And this is why, uh, I mean, again, I don't want to anticipate what you're going to say, but so many of the churches, the Orthodox churches, the heads of churches in the Middle East, uh, uh, treasure the, the, these covenants and, and gave you access to them because, you know, it gives them, the, the, uh, in Islamic context, the, their rights, inalienable rights, uh, pertaining, as you say, to their lives, wealth, property and religion. So these are very precious documents. So they treasure them and we're happy to share them with you, I, I understand, in your travels. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. So um, another thing is they form part of uh, what we labeled as the official writings of early Islam. So it's uh, well documented that the prophet and like, you know, the early caliphs, they all issued written decrees. And we don't have an anthology of all these written, uh, of, of these writings. I mean, there's no anthology in one book that exists, but we know uh, from various uh, historical works that they were issued and they were written down and some of them obviously have been preserved but the best uh, reference work to date is um, so it can be translated as, a, as the compendium of political documents from the uh, early prophet 
Hypothetic Period and the Rightly Guided uh, Caliphate by Muhammad Hamidullah. So it's an Arabic book, and it's, mm. I think, over 700 pages. So it's a, qu quite a big book. And there he tried to combine, to collect all of the writings of early Islam that he knew of uh, until the, the period of the Rightly Guided Caliphs. And so in that book, he also does document some of these doc covenants from non-Muslim communities, not all of them, but a, a vast chunk of them he does he does collect. So mm. he, he, yeah, so he pr preserved, he brought everything that he knew of from the Muslim sources and also these, these various covenants. And what we did in the book is we thought, okay, if we're going to compare these different documents, then every religious community, I mean, that's an assumption, would not really have had that much of that much of an inter. I mean, obviously they interacted with one another, but they were all set in their own way. So they were all independent. So all these different religious communities have their own respective texts, and that's mm. why we labeled them as independent texts. So the, the the assumption is that it's highly unlikely that a Christian person and a Jewish per person and or a Zoroastrian person they would mm. all come together together and forge these documents. Yeah, you see that that that's not very likely, and mm -hmm. we'll get in more into that as to why, when you study the texts themselves, it's even more unlikely that this could have happened. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and um, so these are the covenants, the independent texts that we managed to identify. So the covenant with the monks of Mount Sinai is probably the most uh, popular. Then the covenant with the Christians of Najran, which exists in the Chronicle of Sirt, uh, where it first appears, which dates from the 10th century, which is a, a, an ecclesiastical history. And the covenant with the Armenian Christians, which is not very well documented. It exists in only in one booklet we found it, but it's obviously copied from a manuscript. And then we have uh, the Prophet's governance with the Jewish communities. So the covenant with the Jews of Chaibah and Makna, that was found in the Cairo Geniza. It was documented by Hartwig Hirschfeld in uh, one of his articles back in 1904, I think it was, or 1903, I can't remember now. And there's another covenant uh, with the children of Israel, and that comes from the Yemen. So that's been documented by, by Yemeni Jews, and it was kept in their possession. And then uh, we have the Prophet's Covenant with the Samaritans, which uh, was documented in a book of Samaritan uh, history uh, by Abu al-Fatih al-Samiri. And the Prophet's Covenant with the Magi, uh, that came to light uh, by a, a Zoroastrian philanthropist in India back in the 1800s. But it's also been documented in Islamic sources. So it's been uh, documented by Abu Nu'aym, in his Dhikr Akhbar Isfahan, sorry, and then um, uh, Abu Sheikh Al Asfahani in his book, uh, I can't remember the, name of the book's name now, but it, it, he documented it as well, sorry, just the, mm -hmm. my mind, uh, yeah, got mental block. Mm -hmm. So these are the different documents that we, we looked at. So can, can okay. I just ask, I, I just yes. want to say, you were mentioned that I can see in the slide there about the constitution of Medina. Uh, you're going to perhaps talk about that because that, that that for me is you know this is the earliest, is it not, sort of covenant or constitution uh, of the Umar will be the Prophet himself. But you're going to come to that. I can see that now. Thank you. Yes. So yeah. So what what we tried to do was to look at the documents in a in a holistic manner. So mm. to not not just to look at the Muslim doc to compare the Muslim doc documents to the non-Muslim documents. So that, that, that we know of. And obviously the most famous of these is the constitution of, uh, of Medina. But there were other documents that we came across, like the letter of uh, the Prophet to Al-Ala ibn al-Hadami, to one of his companions. Uh, the compact with the people of Najran, which is also very well documented in the Islamic sources. And the Safina arbitration agreement. And what we found is that really there's no evidence of cross-communal borrowing or influence between these different communities. When, when you really, when you analyze the language. Right. So I don't know, maybe uh, Professor Ibrahim would like to. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in addition to what I said, uh, I, I would like just to uh, say this. Uh, at the beginning, we were saying uh, these are documents 
not in the custody of Muslims. Mm. And for Muslims, it's important for any document to be attributed to the Prophet وسلم, there should be an isnad, there should be a chain of transmission. Uh, and obviously, uh, these documents do not have any kind of chain of transmission, a reliable Islamic chain of transmission, because the whole idea of a chain of transmission is that one Muslim will say that he heard this from another Muslim and another Muslim, it goes back to the Prophet وسلم, all these people should be known to us as uh, fair-minded and, and intelligent and having sound memory uh, and practicing Muslims. But here what we found, we found documents. Mm. Uh, and, and there is no such a thing as Isnad there. Mm. Now, we decided to say this, that it's common sense to say that if you want actually to uh, know something which relates to history, uh, perhaps there are going to be three ways of knowing it. Uh, I mean, well, one of them perhaps is, is, is a document which is going back in history to a certain era. Uh, so this is a kind of a, a document-based episteme. And then the second one would be a, a document-based episteme, and then also it does have a chain of transmission. Uh, and the third one, which is most of the Islamic sources, I mean, going back to the time of the Prophet وسلم, and early Islam, would rely on Isnad, a chain of transmission. Mm. So, uh, I mean, we as Muslims, as historians also of, of, of early Islam, we will accept the fact that uh, uh, if there is a document, so the kind of uh, uh, methodic procedure that we are going to re rely upon is going to be different from uh, the procedure of the Isnad or the chain of transmission. Mm. Here we are going to look into the content of mm. which is there in the in the document. We are going to look into the phraseology. We are going to look into the ipsisma verba. We are going to compare this document with other similar documents, and we will look at the scribal convention and some other uh, ways of detecting and verifying the truth and falsity of this document. So this mm. is what exactly we. We, we did throughout the book when we were dealing with uh, these different uh, uh, documents which have been collected, as I said, by Ahmad. I mean, he, as, again, I mean, I should emphasize this, that he is the one who did the wonderful work of uh, collecting all the data that we needed for writing this book. So you've got a sound critical methodology here, haven't you? As, as I was going to say, a, a sound historical critical methodology. You're not just accepting these things at face value. You know, you're doing your historical analyses, textual and so on, linguistic, um, to arrive at the conclusions you have. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And, and just to add on uh, Professor Zane's point, I mean, also, we, we really would like to thank, um, you know, all, all the church leaders who supported us, because I think without them, this book would not have come to light. So obviously the Greek Orthodox Church, the Armenian Apostolic Church, the Syriac Orthodox Church, all of these people who came together and supported us. So we consider them part of the team in a sense. So even though we did the writing, it, it you know it's thanks to them and, and thanks to their uh, uh, trust in us that we managed to, to, to produce this book. This was something that struck me when I, I saw your book is the recommendations on the on the cover from some very eminent, prominent church leaders of these various churches, Orthodox churches and so on. And how much this is a collaborative exercise between eminent Christian leaders, ecclesiastics and yourselves as historians and Muslims. So this is a very, um, you know, a, a very a, a, a enlightening and very heartening experience. Uh, I can see you have that. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, to be honest, I had the opportunity to go to Mount Athos and, and the monks were, were really ex exceedingly nice, really, uh, to, to put it, you know, uh, with me. And, and, and they were very kind and generous and, and, and they received me very well. So, Because um, Mount Athos is, is the centre of the Orthodox world. I mean, this is like yeah. the epicentre of Orthodox spirituality and, and uh Wow, so that you, you weren't the first Muslim ever to go to Mount Athos, were you? I mean, I, I, perhaps you were. No, 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 no. Apparently, you've had Muslims who who, who went there before. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So. <laughs>
Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, but I, I was asked before people would ask me, you know, how was it the experience? And yeah, it was an amazing experience and a very humbling yes. experience, I have to say. Gosh, amazing. Thank you. Okay. And um, yeah, I think maybe this this point we, we pretty much covered uh, in our discussion. And uh, I think in, in this section, uh, the question often comes up, when do the covenants uh, with Christian communities first appear? Mm. So uh, usually I think there's this misconception that the covenants were uh, concocted during the Ottoman uh, period. Mm. And the reason for that is most of the manuscripts that we have, uh, they date from the Ottoman period. So in, if you go, for example, to the, to, um, if you look at the uh, Saint, Library of St. Catherine, Mount Sinai, they have 46, uh, 44 scrolls in Ottoman Turkish, and they have six Arabic scrolls and two booklets, which are in Arabic and Ottoman Turkish. So all of these documents uh, go back to the Ottoman period. And I think because of that, there is this, this misconception that you know these these documents came about in the you know when the Ottomans took took power, and yeah. after the conquest of Egypt by Sultan Selim I in 1517, and uh, this is not actually quite uh, accurate. And I think part of the inaccuracy for that is um, when John Andrew Morrow published his book, he had a an image of a uh, covenant uh, from the monastery of Saint Catherine, uh, and I think. Uh, that, that that was on it, and and mm. you know, people have assumed that this document, uh, you know, is 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 a forgery and even dates from the time of the, the prophet. But when you examine the document uh, itself, it has mm. beautiful artwork, and I think, like Professor Zane was saying, the fact that you have this beautiful artwork, um, you know, that shows that this is a very important document. It's not just an ordinary document, and that's why these documents have been preserved because if they had written them on you know on you know with on white normal paper like like we we use today it would have been discarded but by putting it on on such beautiful paper with 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 beautiful artwork then it, it, they knew that this was something that would be that was valuable that it was a valuable document and then on these documents as well you have the seal of the judge or the qadi the muslim qadi right and as a, on occasion as well, the seal of the Sultan. So this is an official document that was issued to these patriarchates or monasteries. And it, for anyone who's familiar with the um, firmans of the Ottoman Sultans, the style follows the way these these uh, the firmans of the Sultans were were, were, were done. So right. when you look at a, at a firman, you'd have the Torah of the Sultan, you'd have it written in different color, colored ink, and you'd, you'd have it, it would have this kind of official stature. And mm. just to um, clarify, so this is the, the this manuscript is actually on the cover of John Andrew Morrow's book. And I, I don't know why, but there seems to have been there's this misconception even on Wikipedia that this is the original covenant of the Prophet, and it isn't. And John Andrew Morrow never claimed that. Yeah. And the manuscript itself doesn't claim that. And thanks to uh, Father Harith from the uh, St. Joseph of Damascus Manuscript Center, which is part of Balamand University uh, in Lebanon, we managed to get a high resolution uh, image of this, um, of this uh, document. And as you can see, if you zoom in, so I'm trying <laughs> with a pointer here. So I've zoomed in here. You have uh, the seal of the Qadi, of the judge. And here it says that uh, it's a copy. I mean, it actually says this, that yeah. this is a copy of the of the document. And so where, where is here? It? We're not zooming in on, on what I can see. Is it on the top right hand corner, a little circle? Is that the seal? Or yes, is it yes. So that, yes, in the top okay. right hand corner. Okay. I think just that thing. Yeah. yeah. And just above that, it says that, you know, in um, that this is actually a copy. Right. of the covenant doesn't say it says this is a replica of the ahd Ame that has been issued based on the original when you translate that text that is just above the seal and what right. is this an original sorry, just to clarify what is this a copy of what's the original uh what is the original covenant so what they're saying is that the original was 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 issued by the prophet and this is a replica 
replica. This this actual copy is a replica. So right. the, 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 the document itself doesn't claim that this is the original one. No, no, no. I just want to close a copy of that was all. It's, it's, it's a treaty yeah. issued by the Prophet Muhammad himself. Uh, with who? Uh, so with which group again? With the Christians? So this is with the, yes, with the monks of Mount Sinai. So this document Mount? is, wow. yeah. And it okay. was displayed uh, there at some point in the, I mean, in the that, library. That, that, you know, it's important to, to, to many people in the West as well, because it's where the Codex Sinaiticus, this um, monastery, St. Catherine's, uh, where the Codex Sinaiticus was discovered in the 19th century. And it's the oldest complete New Testament in the world. And that's now in the British Library, uh, mostly in, I'll say mostly parts of it in Leningrad as well, or St. Petersburg. So th th this is an incredibly important monastery that had immense prominence historically. It wasn't just a monastery. It was something that clearly had been gifted with um, some very important um, biblical codexes, as well as this copy of the covenant so it was a, a place of learning uh, and research and libraries as well as a monastery historically it's absolutely in. and actually our friend mm -hmm. dimitris uh, Kal kalomirakis who's very well uh, versed with the orthodox tradition and the tradition of the, the, the monks of mount sinai so he was saying that but when the prophet gave it to the monks of mount sinai it's actually giving it to the whole orthodox world because you're not yeah. just giving it to some ordinary monastery you're giving it to yeah. a very important monastery yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. It was very important centuries before the prophet. Uh, uh, so that makes a lot of sense to me anyway. Yeah. yeah. So and, and another evidence that this is not uh, the original is it's actually written in Ottoman Turkish. It's ah. not Arabic. No. <laughs> so it cannot be the original. And here you have the name of uh, the scribe. So he, he writes his name. He says uh, his name is Namat Allah Ibn Uthman. And on just by the mosque, you have some notes, uh, the, the, the mosque on the bottom right and above the hand in black, which is the, the you know, a representation of the prophet's hand, uh, mm -hmm. giving protection to the monks. Uh, you have a date and the date is 1048 of the Hijra, which is the equivalent of 1638. So wow. nothing in that document claims <laughs> to be, you know, there's nothing in here that, that, you know, to make the claim that this is the original, it's, you know, and the document itself, every every feature of this document mm. um, tells us that it's a copy. Yeah, absolutely. So um, how can we know then that the covenants existed prior to the Ottoman period? So when we when we examine the different uh, covenants, uh, the, the three independent covenants, uh, texts given to Christian communities. So the covenant with the monks of Mount Sinai, with the Armenian Christians, with the Christians of Najran, we notice that they're all very, very similar in terms of their terms and condition, their conditions to Christians. So all these covenants, we don't know how many were issued by the prophet, peace be upon him, but all of the ones that he did issue would have been quite similar in what they say. Mm. They would not be that different. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. The covenant with the monks of Mount Sinai was scribed by Ali in the third year of the Hijra. Uh, sorry, in the second year of the Hijra, in the third of Muharram, the month of Muharram. And the covenant with the Armenian Christians was scribed by Muawiyah uh, in Dual Hijra of the second year of the Hijra. And the covenant with the Christians of Najran, again, it was scribed by Muawiyah uh, on the last day of the fourth month of the fourth year of the Hijra. That's what it actually says on the manuscript, which is the 29th of Rabi al Thani uh, in the year uh, 4AH. So there are a number of pre Ottoman uh, references uh, to the covenants. Um, so these are some of the historians and church uh, leaders who actually made a reference to them. Uh, so I don't know, maybe if you. So it was a Bar Hebraeus. It sounds, sounds Jewish. Is that a Jewish? The first one at the top there, Bar Hebraeus. Is that? <laughs> no, he, no, no. He was a, 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 yeah, Christian. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. All of these are, are Christians, uh, yeah. except for Abdullah ibn Ishaq ibn Ismail al Hashimi, and he's the one who, um, in the Apology of Al Kindi, uh, he actually made a reference to the covenants before. Uh, the Christian Abdul Masih al-Kindi responded to 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 his to his uh, letter. So it was an early 
a, a Christian uh, apology of, for Christianity against Islam. But the, the Muslim um, who wrote uh, the initial uh, uh, letter to his Christian friend, um, he, he actually made a reference to them. Um, yeah, but I, I would say probably the most important reference is that of John Bar Penkaye. Uh, who wrote uh, in the year 67 of the Hijra. So he actually was uh, living in the time of Muawiyah and of the Catholicos Ishrab III of the Assyrian Church of the East. So presumably these two writers knew of some kind of covenant that was given by the Prophet to the Nestorian Church. So these are two very, very early independent witnesses to, <coughs> to, to this, yep. uh, in addition to the copy that you were mentioning in the previous slide. So this is a multiple attestation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can quote for you uh, John Bar Penkaye, if you like. Please, that would be fascinating. So, yeah, so he was living in the time of uh, Muawiyah, and he says, from the Westerners, a man named Muawiyah became king and took control of the kingdoms, both of the Persians and of the Romans, just as flourished in his days, and there was a great peace in the regions he controlled. He allowed everyone to conduct himself as he wanted, for as I said above, they upheld a certain commandment from him who was their guide, so what is that commandment you know this is this is the first question and the person who was their guide is obviously a reference to the prophet muhammad mm -hmm. uh, and then he continues concerning the christian people and the monastic order so he's clearly saying that there was some kind of commandment to hold the christians in honor right and we asked uh, our friend, uh, Father Gabriel Accuse from the Syriac Orthodox Church, because he's fluent in Syriac, to read this, this passage. And um, he was, you know, for him, it was quite clear that it could only be a reference to the covenants. Because wow. sometimes when, we, when, when we've presented papers and they got rejected, people would, you know, the, the responses we get from the, the peer reviewers is that this reference cannot be a reference to the covenants. So our question would be, what well, what's it a reference to? Mm -hmm. And it seems very unlikely that it's, it's not, I mean, that it can only be a reference to the covenant. I, I, I can't see it personally, or well, maybe Professor Zeng would like to add to this. I can't see it being um, a reference to anything else. And yeah, because before that, even in this text, he says, God had previously prepared them to hold the Christians in honor. So John Bar Pen Penkaya says this when he describes the Arabs coming out of the peninsula, he's surprised, obviously, how could these men who have, you know, no armor, he calls them barbarians, come out from nowhere. He said, God, it's an act of God. And he said, and he says that they had a, a commandment to hold the Christians in honor. So, so what is that command? Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I mean, the observation which was made by John Babankai uh, is is a direct reference to to the covenants which were issued to the Christians at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the, the the issue here, I guess we we, we were looking at these uh, historians who were not Muslims, and and in their uh, narratives, they were having a, a, a direct or indirect reference to these documents which were issued by the Prophet Now, what, what we are having, as you said, uh, Paul, that this is a kind of an indirect attestation of the covenant. Now, these are historians uh, from different ages, uh, from different religious uh, uh, affiliations, and they are writing about events in early Islam, and they are referring to the covenants, but not necessarily actually quoting these covenants in their books of history. And now we are having the covenants in our custody that we are going to analyze. So what we are doing is, is looking at this kind of shared memory mm. uh, between Muslims and non-Muslims and how this shared memory, memory has been looked at by different religious communities. Mm -hmm. And now we are making that conclusion. Of course, it's a kind of a tentative conclusion, but uh, it, it, it will be a kind of a direct, indirect attestation to what we are doing uh, when we collected the data from the different Christian uh, churches and, and the Jews and Samaritans and Magi as well. Okay. 
Also, I think one important point is that uh, in the Islamic sources, you have only two uh, two compacts. We call it so. The, what we have from the Muslim sources in the book, we refer to them as compacts, not to confuse with the covenants. And we have one to the Christians of Najran, which is different to the to the copy we have in the Chronicle of Sirte. And we have another one with Yohanna ibn Ruba. So these are the two that we have documented in our sources that which the Prophet gave to Christians. And obviously, if you go back to some of these early references, so the, the other reference, which is Catholicos uh, Ishrab the third, when he, he mm. talks about um, the Arabs, he says they are even praisers of our faith, honorers of our Lord's priests and holy ones, and supporters of churches and monasteries. So the, the documents that we have in our sources make no reference to the monks and honoring the monks and, and, and the priests and supporting monasteries and churches. There's no reference to that in the, in the documents in the Islamic sources that we, we know of, that have come down to us. So again, uh, we have to look outside the Islamic sources you know, to try and find an answer as to what these uh, writers were, were referring to. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, scribal conventions. Okay, can I just, just get here before, yes. <clears throat> excuse me, before we, go to the scribal convention. The fact that this research is not about only the covenants, but as uh, Paul, you, you observed at the beginning of this uh, discussion, uh, that we are collecting all the political documents of early Islam. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and these political, uh, these uh, uh, early documents of, of uh, these documents of, uh, of, of, of early Islam, perhaps, I mean, uh, the, the language, the phrases are going to be similar, okay? And, and, uh, and the textual and historical analysis that we, we were doing was, was, about, was about the content of these documents. As I said to you, we don't have a chain of transmission. The only thing that we will resort to, to verify the truth and falsity of these documents is to look into the content of these documents. Now, uh, as you refer to the Constitution of Medina as a uh, well-attested uh, uh, document of early Islam, I mean, uh, great Orientalists like Wilhausen and others, they said it is uh, an authentic document. Now, that document also, we looked at the historians who were contemporary to the Prophet وسلم, like Sabayas. And Sabayas, uh, in a quotation that we had in the book, was saying directly that he himself was in the know of the fact that the Prophet ﷺ drafted uh, a treaty between him and the Jews of the Medina at that time. Yeah, so I mean, he mentioned that, an alliance. So from that alliance, we, we can, we can it, 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 it fits with, with the constitution of Medina, basically. Yeah, and, and we will also look at the physiology of the constitution of Medina, the kind of rights which were given to uh, the Jews of Medina and others, and the physiologies that were used in the documents that we were analyzing. I mean, the documents in the, the study of the Christian, the Jews and the Magi, which we analyzed in our book as well. Mm. It's, it's, it's not just, just one way of looking at it, I mean, we have like multiple perspectives. Mm. Uh, look at looking at this these documents of early Islam in, in a holistic way. I mean, we we are looking at all the documents. The assumption is that I mean, all these documents were issued by one person uh, and his companions after him, and the likelihood that they are going to use the same language, the likelihood that they are going to speak about the same kind of sensibilities uh, is highly visible in the documents that we analyzed. And I, I think that kind of assumption is very easy to defend. Mm. It's a stronger case, it seems. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So, yeah, when it comes to these scribal conventions, what we did is we looked, looking at these different documents belonging to different communities, we see uh, a number of salient features. So you'd have a date, 
uh, the name of the scribe, a list of witnesses, and usually references to these documents having having been sealed with the Prophet's seal. And uh, these uh, features, uh, they're backed by archaeology because there's an inscription called the Jerusalem 32 inscription, which was discovered, um, uh, I think, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where. And if you look at that, uh, it's, it's on actually on a stone slab. And uh, in that, in that um, inscription, it says that they have the protection of Allah and the guarantee of his messenger. So the idea of giving protection to the non-Muslims is there. Right, and then in that stone slab it says it, it was witnessed by Abdurrahman ibn Auf uh, al-Zuhri and Abu Abayda ibn al-Jarrah. So you have witnesses, which is again the same style as the covenants that we we looked at. And then it has the name of the scribe who is Muawiyah. And then wow. it has a year. It says the year thirty-two. So probably in the year thirty-two of the Hijra, uh, that's when that that inscription was done. So the again. To, sorry, Jerusalem 32 in e.g. Jerusalem 32 on that slide refers to the year, uh, yes. in fact, it was dated. Yep. Okay, good. So, and on that, that stone slab corresponds to how the covenants were actually, um, you know, written that we have come down to us. Yeah, so that's an archaeological evidence in favor of them. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and if we go back to the caliphate of uh, Omar, uh, that's when most of the, you know, the vast majority of the conquests uh, occurred. And all the historical sources, I mean, and, you know, the Muslim and non-Muslim sources, they all mentioned that when Omar um, was caliph, he issued uh, covenants to the various non-Muslim populations. And not just him, but also his generals. So Khalid ibn al-Walid, when he entered Damascus, he issued a treaty. And Amr ibn al-As, when he entered Egypt as well. So these are universally acknowledged by both sources. Even if the sources are later, they all state that these, these documents were issued. And the Muslim jurists, they uh, universally acknowledged that as well, uh, that these documents, you know, that documents were, um, were mostly issued w during the time of Umar. And Abu Yusuf is a very important uh, source of this in his Kitab al-Kharaj. So when he was, uh, uh, answer, uh, he, when he was writing to the caliph Harun al-Rashid, uh, Harun al-Rashid asked him, you know, how come uh, the, the churches and synagogues uh, of the Jews and Christians have been preserved? And then he answers uh, that the reason for this is because of the truce that took place between them and the Muslims, and which stipulated payment of the jizya in return for their synagogues and churches to be protected, for their lives to be protected, and uh, for the Muslims to fight their enemies uh, on their behalf. And based on these conditions, uh, that's why uh, their churches and, and, and synagogues were, were protected and uh, not destroyed. So he is aware of, of, of documents of some sort that were also issued. Right. Okay. And uh, apart from Abu Yusuf, uh, which, which we, you know, I, I just mentioned, uh, there's also Hadith of Omar, uh, which mm -hmm. is Sahih. It's even in, in Bukhari. And oh. Omar, he actually says, I make a bequest to the Caliph who will succeed me uh, to be good to the protected people. Uh, he, he says that Caliph must fulfill the covenant that has been granted to them, fight on their behalf, and not burden them with more than they can bear. So what Omar is saying in that Sahih Hadith matches with what we know of the covenants. Yeah. And in the historical works, so at Tabari and also uh, Eutychius of Ale Alexandria, who was the patriarch of, um, of, uh, of Ale the Orthodox patriarch of Alexandria, he makes, he, rec he reports that Omar and Khalid ibn al-Walid uh, uh, issued uh, documents to, to the Christians, so of, of Damascus and of Jerusalem. And at Tabari as well, he, he quotes the, the capitulation treaty with with um, which Omar gave to 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 the Christians of Jerusalem uh, when he entered the city, and uh, that capitulation uh, sorry that capitulation uh, treaty clearly mentions that their churches uh, shall not be destroyed or inhabited, and uh, that they have protection for their lives, their offspring, their wealth, and their church uh, and uh, their churches. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you have any any questions on on this. No, not a moment. No, thank you.
And yeah. now again, I just, just would like to emphasize the fact that these capitulation treaties, which were done by uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab or his generals, when we studied them, we realized that they have uh, shared phraseologies, shared ipsisma verba, with the covenants that we are having. Now, I, I mean, the conclusion that can be drawn from this is that uh, it seems, I mean, these were written by the same person uh, or the same people who are having the same mindset. Uh, I mean, uh, especially when we compare this not only to the Christian, but also to other, Christ, uh, other uh, religious groups like the Magi, like the Jews, uh, and others. So as, as we, when we started this conversation, we were saying that it's highly unlikely that all these people will come to forge a document yeah. uh, and to use the same phraseology, keeping in mind that these people were not, uh, 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 I mean, in direct conversation with each other. Uh, you, you, uh, just, just to mention, to, to, you've twice now used that expression ipsissima verba, and that's Latin, of course, and it means the very word. So it's a legal term, usually referring to, um, you know, material that a writer, that a writer or speaker is referring to. So this is not this is precise language that you're seeing in different places in uh, communities that would not naturally have collaborated or shared uh, or come to a common wording, suggesting. Um, multiple attestation, to use that expression again. So ipsis verba is a, a technical term, really, uh, a legal term, usually. So, Correct, yeah. This is what I mean. And uh, Sebeos, uh, I think, um, who Professor Ibrahim mentioned, uh, he's also, he was writing in the 660s, when he mentions, um, he makes, again, a very, um, a reference, obviously, to, the, to this capitulation treaty, he says, then having requested an oath uh, from them, so he's, he's talking about the Christians, they submitted to, to them, so the, to the Muslims. So that oath, what is that oath that he's talking about? He doesn't clearly spell it out as a treaty, but it seems to be in the context of what we know that he's referring to a treaty uh, when, when, when the Muslims entered Jerusalem. So again, it's a very it's a very elusive reference, just like the Constitution of Medina when he's talking about this alliance between Muslims and, and Jews. It, it does fit in with what we know. Yeah. Okay. Um, and obviously, these documents, which uh, the first caliphs of Islam issued, what was the reason for that? Was it based on? A verbal commandment of the prophet was it based on something you know like a, a, a written decree of the prophet and all the evidence points to actually that it was actually based on a on a written decree and uh in the book uh, we documented an edict of muawiyah uh which again belongs in the uh, it, it's it's a greek document so our friend uh, uh demetrius he's the one who brought it to our attention and it was translated from arabic into greek but in that document, uh, Muawiyah, he says that the reason he's giving this document to the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate is because Omar, Omar ibn al-Khattab had done so and that the Prophet had also done so. And so again, and that, that's a clear uh, uh, reference to a written document of the Prophet mm -hmm. and the former later on. And Ali, he also, that's in the Kitab al-Kharaj of Abu Yusuf, Ali had sent a letter to the Christians of Najran when they relocated in Iraq. And in that letter, he says to, he says to them, you brought me a writ from the Prophet of Allah. So you brought me a, a written document from the Messenger of God. And that he is issuing this, he's confirming that document and also documents that were given to them by Abu Bakr and by Omar. So again, that Abu Bakr and Omar also uh, get, granted them uh, written uh, edicts and there's also another covenant so uh, uh, a former so that he gave a capitulation treaty to uh, patriarch Sophronius, but he also gave him a covenant so we have two documents of former uh, mm -hmm. the, the latter one the covenant with the christians of jerusalem that exists in the archives of the of the greek orthodox uh, church and in that document omar says that basically the reason i'm giving you this document is because uh, the prophet uh, had commanded us uh, to be uh, to to um, uh, 
to, to come out for you to be looked after and protected. And he says that he did that with his blessed hand. And if you look at all the manuscripts uh, from St. Catherine's Monastery, they all have this tradition that he, because he, he didn't know how to read and write. So when he was young, they dipped his hand in ink and he, with his handprint, he sealed the document. So he makes mm. a reference to that hand, to the, the prophet's hand and how he gave him that, that protection. And that is the reason why he's giving that document to uh, St. Sophronius. Okay, can I just, just say this Maybe, before yeah. you go to conclusion, Ahmed? Uh, uh, one thing is that uh, the capitulation treaty of Jerusalem, of Ilya, at the time of Umar, uh, it, it was a time when Umar actually made this city again uh, a, a, a common spiritual city for all Christian churches. I mean, Sophronius, uh, and his church at that time they were banning the jews to get into the uh, the city because of their position uh, i mean the, in, in late antiquity when they sided with the persians mm -hmm. and and they persecuted the christians when the persians were taking over the city now when heraclius came and liberated the city again uh, the jews were banned from getting into the city and in addition to that, after uh, uh, after the Chalcedonian uh, Council, the non-Chalcedonian churches were not allowed to get into the city as well. Mm. So when it was a very important and unequivocal uh, in, I mean, uh, statement which was made by Omar that all other uh, Christian denominations should be given access to the holy city and the Jews as well should be given that kind of access to the city. So I should safely say as a historian, I mean, that capitulation uh, treaty between Omar and, and Sophronius was a very important, uh, uh, I mean, event in the history of the city uh, mm. to allow all people who believe that this is a holy city to be given access to it. Mm. And, 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 and I guess the Armenians were, were, were very, as well, as well as the the Coptics and, and, and other churches who were banned from entering the city were very grateful to Omar mm -hmm. by the act that he did and he forced actually Sophronius to agree to this. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. the second thing about the, uh, uh, whether the Prophet Sallallahu went to St. Catherine, uh, because Ahmad was referring to this, that he was having his hand there. Now, we all know that the Sirah of Ibn Ishaq and some other sources, in addition to Ibn Ishaq, uh, never mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ traveled to that place. Okay, but we all also know that there are so many gaps in the Sira. I mean, the Sira was not a comprehensive and detailed uh, account on the journeys of the Prophet ﷺ and the places he visited and the people whom he talked to. I mean, the Sira reflected actually the vision, the Sira that we know of Ibn Ishaq and, and the, I mean, the edition of, of Ibn Hisham, we know it's, it's not comprehensive. It does reflect, I mean, the activity of a great uh, scholar like Ibn Ishaq, the materials that he collected, which is by and large, uh, the kind of uh, materials which were available in Medina at the time when Ibn Ishaq was writing his sirah. So nobody actually should, should use this as an evidence, because it's an, an absence of evidence cannot be used as an evidence for absence. Yeah. Uh, sure. But we also agree that these are gaps that we do not have knowledge about uh, the activities of the Prophet Sallallahu whether he visited uh, the St. Uh, Catherine Monastery or not. <coughs> right. I, I think also to add to that point, when it comes to gaps, one of the criticisms you have of the co covenants is that apparently they have uh, glaring mistakes. So, for example, when you have Muawiyah's name uh, as a scribe of the Prophet in the second year of the Hijra, the fourth year of the Hijra, people would say, "Aha, this is a this is a this is an error." But there's a problem with that. Uh, first off, why would any Christian forger put Muawiyah's name in the Abbasid period or any time after that? I mean, it was well well known that he wasn't, according to what we know of history, that he wasn't a Muslim by that time. Mm. So we came up with two possibilities. The first is uh, 
Ali's name was probably on the document, and during the Umayyad period, uh, his name was replaced by that of Muawiyah. Mm. Or that Muawiyah was perhaps an early convert to Islam, and that when the Abbasids took over, they wanted to, to cover that up. But whichever way you argue, you, the documents, these documents would be placed in the Umayyad period, not later, because su such a mistake would not have been made after the Umayyad period. And that's a very kind of basic mistake. But if you look at that particular document to the Christians of Najran, the date is accurate to the day of the week. So it's actually a Monday on the 29th, uh, Monday in the, f in, in the last day of the fourth month of the fourth year. And when you apply a converter, you find that that date was actually a Monday. So if you had a very clever monk who decided to forge the document, he would have obviously had to use some kind of calendrical converter to know that that particular date was a Monday, but he wasn't clever enough to know that Muawiyah was a, a late convert. That doesn't make any sense, you know? And mm -hmm. also with the witnesses' names, you know, you have, people have criticized the, you know, how, how come some witnesses are there? And we don't really have any answers to, to these questions, you know? Maybe like, like Professor Zeng, maybe there are gaps in the Sira that we don't know of. Maybe some things have been misreported, uh, or maybe these names were added later on. Uh, maybe the names were deciphered incorrectly by later copyists. There's a whole host of explanations that you can come up with. But because you have these, these mistakes, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't mean that these documents are forged. It doesn't, mm -hmm. the fact that you have anomalies does not equate forgery. And I think mm -hmm. that's a, a common misconception that, that people have. And another very uh, strange, Strange coincidence is one of the covenants to uh, to the Jews of, the, the covenant with the Jews of Khaybah and Makna that has been uh, reported in the Muslim sources. So in the Kitab uh, Tabaqat al Qubha of Ibn Sa'd and uh, in um, Kitab Fatuh al Buldan of Al Baladri uh, and in the Cairo Geniza as well. So in the Cairo Geniza it says the date was written on Friday the 3rd of Ramadan in the year 5. Al Baladri, he says it was written in the ninth year of the Hijra. Now, if you apply a converter, the year five is not correct. Uh, the third of Ramadan does not fall on a Friday in the fifth year of the Hijra. But if you apply the year nine of Al Baladri, then the date comes out correctly again. So again, you can you can see that the year five was probably a, 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 a trans transcription error by the um, by, by the scribe. But again, I mean, how come? Why would forgers include these accurate dates? And these are Christians and Jews who are not familiar with the Hijri calendar, and these dates fall accurately to the um, to the to the day of the week. And I, I think maybe an important point, maybe Doctor, you you would like to um, get into this, is the Safina arbitration agreement, mm. because to give some background, that was um, the agreement that was drafted between Ali and Muawiyah after the civil war. And it's the context is completely different to the covenants. You know, there was a civil war between two Muslim parties, and at the end, they decided to draft uh, a document between them. And when you look at the format of that docu document, it matches with what we know of the covenants. So again, you have um, the name of a scribe, you have uh, a date, uh, you have similar language, uh, the, the, the historical sources tell us that the documents were stamped with the seal of Ali uh, and Muawiyah. Uh, the accurate date again falls, is accurate to the day of the week. So it was Wednesday the 16th um, of Safa in the year 37 uh, AH, which is Wednesday 2nd of August uh, 657 uh, AD. So again, you know, the, the same features. And, you know, we came to the conclusion that if a monk had forged the covenant with the with, with the Christians, then that same monk would have probably had to forge the the Safina arbitration agreement, um, which is highly unlikely. Or, or, I mean, uh, in addition to what Ahmed said about the, the Safina arbitration, we have to keep in mind that both Muawiyah and Ali were the scribes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and their names actually appear. Uh, uh, in these covenants, whether we are issued to the Christians or or others, so if if we know all that that 
this Safin arbitration document can safely be attributed to Ali and Muawiyah. And we studied that. We look at the the chain of transmission. We look at the the text in in on whose custody the text was, and we looked also in the books of history, which documented the treaty, the capitulation. Uh, I mean the the Safin arbitration treaty. And then we realized that uh, these are the two main figures who would appear as the scribes of most of these uh, uh, covenants of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And, and to our surprise, uh, it's the same language, uh, same phrases uh, being used in the covenant and being used in this Safin arbitration document, which reflect, I mean, the document itself, I mean, reflects the sensibility and the way uh, Muawiyah and Ali would conduct themselves if they wanted to hold the treaty between them. Uh, so uh, this is also a kind of an indirect attestation to the validity or uh, perhaps to to the authenticity of the covenants that we used as an evidence, uh, which, of course, I mean, it's a, a kind of an indirect evidence, but for historians, I mean, it's a very important uh, uh, evidence or area from which we can collect an evidence which will uh, make a good case for the authenticity of uh, these documents in the custody of non-Muslims, the Christians and others. So, uh, to, uh, to conclude, <laughs> um, so when we, like Professor Zane was saying now, uh, what do we mean by authentic? If we mean by authentic that the originals are, are in a museum today, then no. That that's not the case. But if we mean by authentic that the texts that we have are generally speaking faithful replicas of the originals, then, then the answer is yes. In that sense, we, we do believe that they are uh, authentic. And the case that we made in the book was, uh, we came up with 10 points. Right. So the first is that they're supported by contemporary historical writings. So like John Bar Penkaye, uh, Catholic Kos, Ishrab III, even Sebeos briefly, um, even though it's a bit elusive, but it seems to support the case of the covenants. Uh, the structure is consistent um, between covenants belonging to different uh, uh, religious communities, accurate dating, uh, archaeological evidence like the Jerusalem 32 uh, inscription, uh, textual parallelisms, not, on not only between the covenants belonging to, to, to the non-Muslims, but also between covenants and Muslim uh, documents in Islamic sources, like the Safin Arbitration Agreement. Um, the fact that both Christian and Muslim historians, uh, as a shared historical memory, report that treaties were actually given out in the time of the Prophet and during the early Caliphate. And also um, eyewitness accounts uh, to, uh, of the original covenants. So, for example, in the Chronicle of Sirte, uh, the the writer, before he reproduces uh, the copy of the, the, the text of the covenant. He says that he had seen the original with his own eyes in the house of manuscripts. Um, same with the Safin arbitration agreement. There are descriptions that they had actually seen the original uh, document. So these, these um, even I think, uh, you remember that reference, Doctor, that you, you found in, um, it was, uh, oh, I can't remember now, but there was that, that um, a philosopher who had uh, uh, in his library a copy of uh, Ali's uh, covenant, and he said that he'd actually seen it with, with his own eyes, and it mm. had the uh, seal of Ali, and it was scribed by his son, Muhammad al-Hanafiyya, uh, al al-Bayhaki. True, true, the Bayhaki, yeah. 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 yeah, which was about Hukama. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is, this is a, a, a Muslim historian who was writing biographies of the philosophers and these philosophers are Muslims, Jews and, and others as well. He was writing biographies of them uh, and in these biographies actually he mentioned uh, the, the covenant that he, he himself came across. Zahir al-Din al-Bayhaqi, this is his name, yeah. And um, 
You also have references in the Hadith literature, like that Hadith of Fama, which we uh, briefly discussed. And also mm -hmm. every now and again, you have um, uh, these very elusive references. So for example, the Hadith of the Prophet, that whoever harms someone with whom we have made a treaty, I shall be his uh, foe on the Day of Judgment. And that particular statement, you have it in different documents. You have it in Christian documents, Zoroastrian documents, uh, and Jewish documents with slight variations. So the hadith seem to support, um, uh, you know, some some of the content content at least of, of these uh, of these documents. And I think uh, very importantly, uh, historical recognition. So this is a page from uh, Munshat al Salatin by Feridun Beg, uh, which he completed in 1575, and he was. Um, uh, the Sheikh, uh, uh, he, he actually possessed the Torah, the seal of the Sultan, and he documented it in his in his uh, in his book. There was Mufti Al Qanun, I think it was, right? The, the his title, yeah. I can't can't remember now. True, yeah. Uh, and this from the Ottoman archives. Of Sorry, we have Sheikh Al Islam and Sheikh Al Qawanin. In, in the Ottoman uh, uh, administration. So he was the one who was taking care of the laws. Uh, and, and he has a kind of a, a portfolio which is as important as the portfolio of Sheikh al-Islam in, in the Ottoman Empire. Hmm. So he was the one who collected all the, all the laws and, and edicts of the sultans and he included <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. He included uh, the 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 covenant of the prophet, uh, which was given to the monks of Mount Sinai, the monastery. Which is, which is here. Yeah, this is the the copy, mm. and the oh. translation in, in Ottoman Turkish on the left. Oh. Um, and this is a book of church records, which has recorded the covenant of Omar with the Christians of Jerusalem. And uh, thanks to our friend, uh, Father Makarios, uh, who's the Archbishop of uh, the, the Greek um, uh, Orthodox Church here in Qatar. So we managed to, um, to obtain uh, a copy of this document. And actually there was a paper that was written about this, um, this uh, manuscript. And the, the author, he claimed that it was a forgery. And again, the same arguments were made. You know, it's very late. You have a, uh, you have floral decorations. You have, uh, you know, different. Uh, you know, every line is written uh, in different ink. And in fact, uh, all these features are again evidence of authenticity because at, at the top of the manuscript you have the Torah of the Sultan, so the seal of the Sultan, who was uh, Mahmoud Khan the uh, second. On the document again, um, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but on the right uh, above. Uh, the, the text on the right, you have this this circle, which is the seal of the of the Qadi. Mm. Uh, and then you also have an observation uh, when you zoom in, uh, which says that this is a replica of the original. So tip aslan musawwa. You have that kind of uh, um, you have that that note on the manuscript. And in short, basically, it's uh, it's um, it was a way for the Ottomans to say that this is an official. Uh, copy um, of the original. Yeah. And um, I think this is a this is a stone slab, uh, which um, uh, well, apparently now um, it's in the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of, in in Fana in Istanbul. But uh, at what one point it was um, in the dependency of Saint Catherine's Monastery in Balat. And you can see the hand of the prophet, and it's a symbolic representation of his uh, pledge to protect the Christians you know, until the end of time, which is what the covenants say. So I think I think that's it. Perhaps you have some questions or. Yes, yeah, so I just want to ask. So the, the, this uh, the book, your book, the covenants of the prophet Muhammad from shared historical memory to peaceful coexistence. That's now published, isn't it? It's a published book. Is that right? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. it's published. It's available. Great. 
Fantastic. So um, I'll, I'll link to it in the description below. But um, what has been the critical reception of it so far? By critical, I mean the scholarly appreciation uh, from colleagues and academics. Uh, have, has there been much in the way of uh, reviews? Um, so, sorry, Professor uh, Ibrahim, sorry, um, either of you. No, I mean, it's, it's too early. I guess the book was uh, published at the beginning of this year. Ah, right. So perhaps uh, up until the end of the year or, or, or uh, sometime in June, perhaps we might hear something. But uh, I tell you this after we finished. I said to Ahmed, now uh, you cannot say that these are forgeries. You have to do the homework. Mm. Uh, if you wanted to stick to that, uh, I mean, the, the standard that these are forgeries, I mean, I mean, uh, you have to do a lot of explanation. I mean, if you are a historical, uh, if you are a historian, a fair minded historian, I mean, there are so many things for you to do to refute the kind of evidence that we presented in this book. Mm -hmm. We are not saying that what we did is a conclusive uh, argument, of course not. I mean, it's, it's open to criticism, it's open to uh, whatever, I mean, scholars are looking for. Uh, but at the same time, now we made a very, uh, we made a good case that you have to consider uh, the authenticity of these documents and you cannot just brush them aside and dismiss them and say these are four years full of stop. But mm -hmm. one important thing I would like to add to the conversation, to the conversation that uh, since the time of Sultan Salim I, the Ottomans consistently actually treated their Christian subjects in accordance with these covenants. And uh, obviously, I mean, uh, I mean, the Ottoman Empire, I mean, uh, did have so many scholars there, competent scholars, who are very knowledgeable about the history of early Islam, and the Christians also they benefited a great deal from these documents. I remember that uh, once uh, the, the, the monks of, of, of Mount Sinai uh, were asked to pay taxes and they went to uh, Istanbul to say, no, we are exempted from taxes. And finally, the, uh, the Sultan uh, decided on their favor that they should not collect from them any taxes. I mean, it's a so wide uh, and, 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 and uncontested fact. Mm, mm. The monasteries and these clergymen were not paying taxes to the Ottoman Empire because of that document. Mm. And also the Egyptians, uh, when, when the Egyptian government wanted actually to draft the constitution for the first time, uh, and they wanted to talk about the rights of non-Muslims, the Coptics, the Coptics said to the... Uh, uh, the Christian, I mean, the, the Egyptian lawyers that we already have uh, uh, a covenant with the Prophet that drafted clearly, mm -hmm. that stipulated clearly our rights and responsibilities. So either you include these rights and responsibilities in your constitution or your constitution will be null and void from Islamic perspective and from our uh, history with the Muslims that we lived in for so many centuries. So these documents were not historical documents that uh, did not have any kind of uh, uh, impact on the life of the Christians who were living uh, with the Muslims. These documents actually govern the relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims for so many centuries. I mean, at least uh, uh, the rights of the Christians uh, and others who were living with the Muslims for more than seven centuries uh, in the mainland of Islam were governed by uh, uh, these documents. So they are valuable documents. And most importantly, I should say, I mean, this is the only time in the history of humanity where we have uh, a religious leader, a founding of a religion or a religious leader who is having a document with people who do not share with him his religion. Mm, mm. I mean, Buddha never did something like this, or Jesus, or Moses, uh, alayhim salam, or any other religious uh, leader that we know of, uh, decided actually to 
uh, fails at this idea of having others who do not share his religious, uh, I mean, sensibility, and still they can live with him. This was only done by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm not now speaking as, as, as a Muslim, but I'm speaking also as a historian. I mean, you look at the human history uh, that we know of, you would never find a unique document like this, which I guess forced the fact that we human beings can live together. And, and uh, this is a great thing, I guess, uh, about uh, there is no compulsion in religion and, and we human beings uh, can live together and can coexist. Uh, and this kind of living together and coexistence can be governed by uh, a legal document like the covenant, which stimulates not only their rights, but their rights and responsibilities. Mm. And their rights and responsibilities uh, were not a kind of rights and responsibilities which will corner them uh, and make them citizens of, uh, I mean, second class citizens. No, they have the same, they enjoyed. I mean, there is a very important uh, uh, phrase in these covenants that they enjoyed the same rights and responsibilities that the Muslims are going to enjoy. No discrimination whatsoever is going to be leveled against them. Mm. And the, 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 these are historical facts that are often not appreciated in the West, of course, in Europe and the United States and so on, uh, where a very different kind of um, paradigm exists in people's minds. But the, the historical record is different. And as you say, for centuries in the Ottoman Empire and other places, uh, there was uh, most, of, not all the time, but most of the time, peaceful uh, coexistence. There were episodes of tension and so on to do with other reasons. But it seems the default position seemed to have been, uh, as you say, uh, peaceful coexistence between Jews and Christians and Muslims and others. You mentioned Zoroastrians and so on, uh, who were also incorporated, at least in Hanafi Madhab, in terms of the people of the book, uh, and, and even people in India, Hindus and so on, eventually. Um, so that this is this is something that needs to be understood in the West a lot more, and I mean, I'm I'm also struck how pluralist it was because even in the West we don't really have thoroughgoing pluralism. In France, for example, uh, Muslims and everyone are expected to submit to one standard, one set of legal re uh, regulations, regardless of their own religious uh, perspective. So you know, think things like polygamy are outlawed, and women can't wear hijab, and walks many walks of life, and it's quite rigid. But at least in in, in, the, in these uh, uh, other contexts, Christians and Jews and Muslims were free to practice their faith without state intervention at all, and that's much more pluralist, arguably, than even what obtains in many city, many countries in the West today. Um, and when I first realised that, I was quite shocked, actually. Um, so, no, I, yeah, I think I, I, agree, I agree with you. I mean, you put it nicely. Uh, that type of pluralism, which was reflected in these covenants uh, gives actually the, the these religious communities an autonomy mm. though they are living yeah yes. i mean they are completely okay. autonomous yeah. uh, in terms of what they are going to do to their progeny or to their religious community i mean mm. uh, i mean muslims are not going to impose on them anything and they were not asked actually to integrate no Mm, mm. I, mean, I mean, that's a kind of a pluralism which do not actually require any kind of integration. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. a kind of a pluralism that allow you to be autonomous, allow you to express yourself the, want you, the way you want to express yourself within the framework of the state. Mm, mm. Uh, it means you, you've got to pay the, 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 uh, the amount of money that you are, you are supposed to pay. And if you don't have the means actually to pay that amount of money, you can be exempted. Mm. And, and, and religious authority was completely exempted from taxation, which is a wonderful thing, I guess, uh, which shows, I mean, uh, how the, the Prophet Sallallahu and the Muslim authority at that time were looking at these uh, religious leaders of these communities. Mm. Now, I agree with you what you said that I mean, uh, it's human. I mean, we're not saying that that the time of the Ottoman, all of it were 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 great times. No, there were ups and downs, of course. Yeah. 
uh, and and uh, we do not condone, I guess, any kind of uh, disrespect for these laws because Islamically speaking, I mean, these religious laws were uh, being issued by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So whoever actually goes against them actually is going against the will of the Prophet and the will of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So those among the Ottomans and others who did not actually respect these uh, regulations, we, we, we do not uh, hold them in any high esteem. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we condemn, I guess, the things that they did to these religious communities which are supposed to be protected by, by Islam. And these are, uh, uh, this is the, actually the, the normative aspect of, of, of these laws. Yeah, so there's an important point to stress. This is not because Muslims are being nice or being kind. This is actually a requirement of the Sharia itself, regardless of the inclinations and dispositions of any individuals or even communities. This is normative, as you say. In other words, it's supposed to be like that, even if uh, communities fail, as they sometimes did, uh, thankfully not most of the time, to live up to their own professed standards. Sure. Ahmed, yeah, do you have yeah, I think um, there is, I think throughout Islamic history, there is this um, acknowledgement that a treaty should govern the relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims. And obviously you've had some, you had some discriminatory uh, measures which, which came into place. Um, but I think when we look at these documents and we look at the, and we, and we briefly examined as well, the Pact of Forma, which does uh, have these, these um, discriminatory measures and that it doesn't really tally with these with these documents so even if at times you know muslims did not um uh you know uh neglected those documents it doesn't change the fact that there is a strong historical case for them and the historical mm -hmm. case for the pacta former is not really um very strong uh, at all I mean, it, it came came from something, you know. I mean, there, there was a recollection, obviously, that Omar did gave did give uh, documents to the non-Muslim uh, communities of his time, um, and it seems that with time you had more discrimination, uh, more discriminatory measures that came into into place. So, and obviously that requires more study, obviously, but. Um, Okay, well, um, in conclusion, I just wanted to thank you uh, both very much uh, for your time, your expertise, and all the enormous work and research and travel and uh, that you've both undertaken. Um, extraordinary, produced this book, The Covenants of the Prophet Muhammad, From Shared Historical Memory to Peaceful Coexistence. I'll link to it in the description below, as I say, along with the other links to other uh, papers that, that people can read to um, learn more about all this. So, um, it's certainly an extraordinary work. I do, I do look forward to reading it in full. I haven't finished it yet. Uh, and also to seeing how it's received in the, uh, you know, the academic community as well and, and how seriously they take this research, um, which is multifaceted and holistic, as you say. It's not just centered on a particular fact or artifact. It, it's a much more comprehensive, multifaceted approach to this. Uh, so it, str it strengthens, like many chords, strengthens a case um, but as you say also, uh, Ibrahim, it's not conclusive proof in an absolute sense. It just pro points to very strongly, you argue, in a particular direction, the authenticity of the documents in terms of their reflecting the originals accurately, I suppose. Um, would that be a fair conclusion, Ibrahim? Yes, yes. I think you said it uh, nicely and I agree with you, completely agree with you. <laughs> I'm totally reflecting back what you have said rather than coming up with my own ideas um well again uh, thank you very much to you both uh, for your time and um inshallah i i wish you great success with this work and i i will watch it with with great interest so thank you very much salam alaikum to you both thank you